and put their faith in science, rational human beings, and knowledge as a way to advance humankind and create a more perfect world. Uh, this uh, belief uh, is extremely dangerous, uh, is extremely dangerous, uh, is extremely dangerous, because uh, it is a short step, as the Jacobins proved with the uh, Committee of Virtue and the Reign of Terror, uh, that once you define certain groups of human beings as impediments to that progress, if you uh, believe that they are incapable of being converted or reformed, uh, then they must be eradicated, 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 eradicated. And I think uh, the, uh, the vast killing projects of, uh, that we saw in the last century by communists and fascists uh, was directly tied to that enlightenment vision. Um, the new atheists uh, argue in some ways uh, along these lines, uh, but what they have done, uh, I think like uh, many utopians, is distort uh, the, the, uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Uh, but what they have done, uh, I think like uh, many utopians, is distort uh, the, the, uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Uh, but what they have done, uh, I think like uh, many utopians, is distort uh, the, the, uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Uh, but what they have done, uh, I think like uh, many utopians, is distort uh, the, the, uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. to understand where we come from, the privilege that's granted to those of us who live after 1859. That's false. That is not true. That was not the state of scientific knowledge when Darwin came along. The scientific community before Darwin, all religious men, not atheists, had already figured out over the preceding decades that the Earth is unbelievably ancient countless millions of years by universally accepted before Darwin. The world was unbelievably ancient and the history of life on Earth has been a progressive story. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. If I were to give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin. Ahead of Newton, ahead of Einstein, he understood that what he was proposing was a truly revolutionary idea. The next big lecture from this, which is Darwin's delay. Darwin comes up with this theory in the 1830s, the late 1830s. He doesn't publish until 1858 or 1859. Well, there's a gap between those two dates of 20 years. Now, in, in recent decades, it's been very widely believed, almost universally believed, that Darwin, that this gap existed because Darwin was afraid of to help him with what he believed. That he held it back, that he concealed it, uh, that he kept it a secret. There is nowhere any evidence of holding back, delaying, or fear of the reaction against his own theory. Unfortunately, most of what most people have heard about Charles Darwin and the discovery of evolution is completely wrong. So if you've heard, as I'm sure everyone listening to me has, that evolution is somehow controversial, uh, well, no, it hasn't been since the 1870s. There are more recent controversies, but those have erupted in the 20th century. This is a new movement. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology.
I would say the self is an illusion. Oh, here I am. Seems to be me. Seems to be one me. One me in charge of this body. Unified. Continuous. It seems to be, well it doesn't anymore actually, but it used to seem to be that it was me a few minutes ago and before that it was me and the little girl and so on, that there was something continuous about the me's generated by this brain and this body. It seems to be that there's a me having a stream of experiences. And it seems to be that I have some effect on my body. I can say, I can raise my hand, <laughs> and I did it. Now, there's plenty of uh, psychological evidence, fascinating stuff. Um, that's just an illusion. We have thoughts. No, really, really. I mean, Libet's work is just the start. Um, we have thoughts that about an action, say. The action happens. There's a correlation. They're in that order. We jump to the conclusion that one caused the other. But we can tell from what's going on in the brain that it isn't like that at all. Um, indeed, uh, we know so much now about the mechanisms of, of, of self-control, uh, of decision-making, of uh, choices and so on, and where they're happening in frontal cortex, prefrontal cortex and so on, again distributed and so on, that the idea of there being a me who initiates actions is just bonkers. No, 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 not in there. There's just this stuff, you know, doing something, whatever it is, and we don't even know fundamentally what it is. Uh, we know so much now, and we don't even know fundamentally what it is. Uh, we know so much now, and we don't even know fundamentally what it is. Uh, we know so much now, and we don't even know fundamentally what it is. Uh, we know so much now, and we don't even know fundamentally what it is. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Well, why not right. deny, I mean, just deny... Uh, <laughs> I think I think these things you know I think it matters what happened in history. Right. At, in the micro uh, microphysical world, the laws of logic, as we know them, do not hold. This is a fact. This is a scientific fact, an observation. We're just made of cells, about a hundred trillion of them. Not a single one of those cells is conscious. Not a single one of those cells knows who you are or cares. Science shows that the universe is in fact a big confidence trick. There is truly nothing here. Your model says this world may not even exist. Yeah. That's not a consistent model. You don't live your life by that model. Yeah, I do. You live as if this, as if this world doesn't exist. It's, it's, it's necessary. So you live as if this world may not even exist. Yeah. Free will is an illusion. I would say the self is an illusion. I can say, I can raise my hand, <laughs> and I did it. Um, that's just an illusion. It's not science, it's a theory of knowledge. This is the philosophy, the philosophy, the philosophy dominated the 1930s and the 40s, 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 the aftermath of World War One. That is the widespread unrest. In Italy, what's happening is a new fascism, a new way of fascism. The media revision of Italian history has already begun. The media revision of Italian history has already begun. The media revision of history has already begun. The media revision of history has already begun. The media revision of history has already begun. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Um, and I'll disagree with you on life always comes from life because we know that life can arise from non-living matter. Uh, we don't exactly know how it happened in this particular incidence, but we know that it can occur. Both John Oro's experiments, the, the, the Miller-Urey experiments, things like that, demonstrate that living, living material can come from non-living material. The revision of history has already begun. So set that one aside and I'll agree that language comes from a mind. Alright, I'll, uh, I'll ask you well, we're not Christians. Language from the mind. Well, I'm not that slide with the language from life. I'm going to agree with you, but uh, it's not Then you're wrong. On the language from the I mind. mean, no, no, you're just, you're, you're scientifically uh, wrong. You don't have Your revision of history has already begun. I'm an objection. Uh, sure, that's why I said go with the language one, because on the, on the other one, you're just scientifically wrong. You're just scientifically wrong. 
You're just scientifically wrong. Miller's experiment has now been thoroughly discredited. Stanley Miller put together a glass apparatus, and in that apparatus he put a mixture of gases that people at the time thought reflected the atmosphere of the early Earth. And those gases were methane, ammonia, hydrogen, and water vapor. But then the professional opinion of what was there on the early Earth changed. In the 60s, geochemists uh, revised their hypothesis and decided that the hydrogen, being very light, would have escaped into outer space. The Earth's gravity isn't strong enough to hold it. And probably the early Earth's atmosphere then consisted of what we now see coming out of volcanoes today namely carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and water vapor. Well, if the early Earth's atmosphere consisted of those gases, then Stanley Miller's experiment would not work. In fact, he himself tried it with those gases, and he found that uh, he couldn't produce any amino acids at all. So the experiment falls apart once you use a more realistic mixture of gases in the apparatus. Miller's test has been repeated many times using the correct atmospheric components. The results are always the same. The amino acids that generated so much enthusiasm in 1953 do not appear. Even if Miller's experiment were valid, you're still light years away from making life. down to this. No matter how many molecules you can produce with early earth conditions, plausible conditions, you're still nowhere near producing a living cell. And here's how I know. If I take a sterile test tube and I put in a little bit of fluid with just the right salts, just the right balance of acidity and alkalinity, just the right temperature, the perfect solution for a living cell. And I put in it one living cell. The cell is alive. It has everything it needs for life. Now I take a sterile needle and I poke that cell. And all its stuff leaks out into this test tube. You have in this nice little test tube all the molecules you need for a living cell. Not just the pieces of the molecules, but the molecules themselves. And you cannot make a living cell out of them. You can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So what makes you think that a few amino acids dissolved in the ocean are going to give you a living cell? It's totally unrealistic. Stanley Miller's experiment was not the only unsuccessful attempt to explain how life originated. Beginning with Russian chemist Alexander Oparin's work in the 1920s, theorists have also proposed chance chemical attraction, and biological seeding from outer space as possible answers. Each has failed to account for how non-living chemicals could have arranged themselves into the most basic components of the first living cell. Distort the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology.
So the worst thing that could ever happen to us is to discover that God exists. God exists. God exists. God exists. God exists. God exists. Their political agenda completely converges, and I think that's not accidental. Their political agenda completely converges, and I think that's not accidental. Their political agenda completely converges, and I think that's not accidental. Their political agenda completely converges, and I think that's not accidental. start with a confession that my goal here is not to win a debate. The discussion we're having tonight does not reflect a debate that is ongoing in the professional cosmology community. If you go to cosmology conferences, there's a lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe. There is no talk about what role God might have played in bringing the universe about. It there are physicists who will tell you that if you take about um, half a dozen physical constants, these are constants that physicists have no explanation for, they just accept that these numbers have the values that they do, and they then do theoretical calculations using their models to say if any one of these half dozen uh, constants was ever so slightly varied, then the universe as we know it would not be possible. Uh, for example, if the gravitational constant was a little bit different, there would be no stars, there would be no galaxies, uh, the entire universe would just be a uniform splurge of hydrogen, for example. You wouldn't have stars, you wouldn't have chemistry, you wouldn't have the formation of the, of the heavier elements, you couldn't have life. And they do the same trick for uh, half a dozen other physical constants. A good example is Martin Rees, the present astronomer royal. just six numbers. If the universe, if constants of the universe are indeed fine-tuned, how do we explain it? How do we explain the appearance that the universe is tuned to bring us into existence? Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. The if you go to cosmology conferences, there's a lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe. There is no talk about what role God might have played in bringing the universe about. That the universe is tuned to bring us into existence. Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. There is no talk about what role God might have played. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants. It is not an idea that is taken seriously. You could say it's the outcome of some kind of design or providence. We could say it's a brute fact we have to accept because these numbers might be determined by some theory which we haven't yet discovered. For a while it was possible to believe that the laws of nature were not so precisely set as to require the hand of a creator. But then a completely new fundamental property of the universe was discovered. An anti-gravity force present in space itself it is called the cosmological constant and when cosmologists calculated its effect on the evolution of the universe they realized it had to be very finely tuned indeed the fine tunings how fine how fine tuned are they most of them are one percent sort of things in other words if a thing is a, a one percent different uh, everything is bad and the physicist could say maybe those are just luck 
Is there a God? No. What is the nature of reality? What is the success it is? What is the purpose of the universe? There is none. What is the meaning of life? Ditto. Why am I just a lot? On the other hand, this cosmological constant is tuned to one part and 10 to the 120, 120 decimal places. Nobody thinks that's accidental. That is not a reasonable idea. That is not a reasonable idea. That is not a reasonable idea. that something is tuned to 120 decimal places just by accident. That's the most extreme example of fine-tuning. No force in the history of cosmology has ever been discovered to be that finely tuned. The cosmological constant needs to be set to one part in a trillion, 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 Otherwise the universe would be so drastically different that it would be impossible for us to evolve. That the cosmological constant arrived at such a tiny value by chance seemed to be out of the question. But the alternative explanation was also impossible to contemplate. Physicists uh, did not want to accept the idea that the laws of nature might be controlled by, uh, by, well, the benevolence of nature. There should be no reason why the luck should just have it that we can exist. It's too much, it's, it's a stretch, it's much too far to stretch. It seemed that hidden in the laws of nature was a value so precise that it was impossible to deny that our universe was designed. But a designed universe requires the existence of a designer, a notion that even the anthropic scientists did not want to entertain. The scientists were between a rock and a hard place. This is this dislike of mixing religion into physics. I think they were somewhat afraid that if it was admitted, that if it was admitted, that if it was admitted, 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 that the reason the world is the way it is uh, has to do with our own existence. That that could be hijacked by the creationists, by the intelligent designers. It is not an idea that is taken seriously. This cosmological constant is tuned to one part and 10 to the 120, 120 decimal places. Nobody thinks that's accidental. That is not a reasonable idea. It is not an idea that is taken seriously. My goal is to explain why we think that. You may or may not agree with me at the end, but you should be able to understand why we cosmologists have that view. Yeah. So the, the, these things. the complexity and... Uh... Yeah, the integrated complexity argument. Now, when you talk about the integrated complexity, yeah. is it the, the um, unlikelihood of that developing naturalistically, the first complex integrated biological system? Is that where the problem you saw? Uh, well, yes, because after all, uh, there is a, a problem about uh, even well, the f a physical nature. There's a, you know, it's, uh, if the integrated complexity of the physical world is a good reason, as Einstein clearly thought it was, of believing that there was an intelligence behind it, then uh, this arg argument applies a fortiori with the inordinately greater integrated complexity of the living world. Mm -hmm. It seems to me as this is just obvious that it, th that argument is much stronger now. And it comes down to a conflict between two major fundamental pictures of the world, what philosophers would call ontologies, naturalism and theism. Naturalism says that all that exists is one world, the natural world, obeying laws of nature which science can help us discover. Theism says that in addition to the natural world, there is something else, at the very least God, perhaps there are other things as well. 
I want to argue that naturalism is far and away the winner when it comes to cosmological explanation. I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in. And it comes down to three points. First, naturalism works. It accounts for the data we see. I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in. Second, the evidence is against theism. This is just obvious that it, that, that argument is much stronger now. And third, theism is not well defined. And I'm going to be emphasizing this third point because if you ask a theist about the definition, they will give you some very rigorous sounding definition of what they mean by God, the most perfect being, the grounding for all existence, and so forth. There are thousands of such definitions, which is an issue. But the real problem is not with the definitions, it's when you connect the notion of God to the world we observe. That's where apparently an infinite amount of flexibility comes in, and I'm going to be inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. Inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. Inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. My goal here is not to win a debate. The discussion we're having tonight does not reflect a debate that is ongoing in the professional cosmology community. Inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. If you go to cosmology conferences, there's a lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe. Inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. There is no talk about what role God might have played in bringing the universe about. Inveighing against using that in, in cosmology. Using that in in cosmology, in in cosmology, in in cosmology, in in cosmology. So I think I can make these points basically by following Dr. Craig's organization, starting with the Kalam cosmological argument. And unlike what he said I should be doing, I want to challenge the first of the premises. That if the universe began to exist, it has a transcendent cause. The problem with this premise is that it is false. There's almost no explanation or justification given for this premise in Dr. Craig's presentation. But there's a bigger problem with it, which is that it is not even false. The problem with this premise is that it is false. It is not even false. That it is false. It is not even false. That it is false. It is not even false. The problem with this premise is that it is false. It is not even false. That it is false. It is not even false. That it is false. It is not even false. The real problem is that these are not the right vocabulary words. These are not the right vocabulary words. These are not the right vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. vocabulary words to be using when we discuss fundamental physics and cosmology. Physicists uh, did not want to accept the idea that the laws of nature might be controlled by, uh, by, by, uh, by, by, uh, by, well, the benevolence of nature. vocabulary words to be using when we discuss fundamental physics and cosmology.
this kind of Aristotelian analysis of causation was cutting edge stuff 2,500 years ago. Today, we know better. <laughs> that the laws of nature might be controlled by, uh, by, by, uh, by, by, uh, by, well, the benevolence of nature. <laughs> Our metaphysics must follow our physics. That's what the word metaphysics means. And modern physics, you open a quantum field theory textbook or a general relativity textbook, you will not find the words transcendent cause anywhere. What you find are differential equations. This reflects the fact that the way that physics is known to work these days is in terms of vocabulary words, vocabulary words, vocabulary words, vocabulary words, unbreakable rules, laws of nature. Given the world at one point in time, we will tell you what happens next. There is no need for any extra metaphysical baggage like transcendent causes on top of that. It's precisely the wrong way to think about how the fundamental reality works. Distort the very disciplines that they claim is the basis for their ideology. We don't know what's out there. People might give you an answer, but they will probably be wrong. But inside these equations, there's a monster. In the extreme gravity at the core of a black hole, Einstein's equations spiral wildly out of control. After a very long, tedious calculation, I mostly get zeros, but the non-zero term is given as follows. M is the mass of the black hole. R describes the distance from the black hole. Here is the problem, right there. When R is equal to zero, the point at which physics itself breaks down. Unbreakable rules, laws of nature. The point at which physics itself breaks down. Unbreakable rules. Physics itself breaks down. Unbreakable breaks down. Unbreakable breaks down. Unbreakable breaks down. Unbreakable breaks down. So one over R, equals one over zero equals infinity. To a mathematician, infinity is simply a number without limit. To a physicist, it's a monstrosity. It means that first of all, gravity is infinite at the center of a black hole, that time stops, and what does that mean? Space makes no sense. It means the collapse of everything we know about the physical universe. It means the collapse of everything we know about the physical universe. Unbreakable rules. It means the collapse of everything we know about the physical universe. This impossible object of infinite density and infinite gravity is called the singularity. We know what a singularity is. A singularity is when we don't know what to do. To me, what's so embarrassing about a singularity is that we can't predict anything about what's going to come out of it. Given the world at one point in time, we will tell you what happens next. That we can't predict anything about what's going to come out of it. Given the world at one point in time, we will tell you what happens next. That we can't predict anything about what's going to come out of it. When physicists tried to combine the two theories, they encountered a familiar problem. I insert this into the probability that gravity will move from one point to another point. When I actually do this calculation, I get yet another integral. And when you do this integral, you get something which makes no sense whatsoever. An infinity. Total nonsense. In fact, you get an infinite sequence of infinities. Infinitely worse than the divergences of Einstein's original theory. This is a nightmare beyond comprehension. Clearly nature has one unique way of operating. It's not schizophrenic. And we humans just 
don't seem to be able to find that way. The equations no longer make any sense. And nobody knows exactly what we're supposed to, to do about that. Well, it's awful. It means that physics is having a nervous breakdown. It means the collapse of physics as we know it. You know? Something is fundamentally wrong. Nature is smarter than we are. So it's quite a big question. It's a huge question. There aren't questions much bigger than this. We don't understand. The question you should be asking is, what is the best model of the universe that science can come up with? By a model, I mean a formal mathematical system that purports to match on to what we observe. So if you want to know whether something is possible in cosmology or physics, you ask, can I build a model? Can I build a model where the universe had a beginning but did not have a cause? The answer is yes, it's been done. 30 years ago, very famously, Stephen Hawking and Jim Hartle presented the no-boundary quantum cosmology model. The point about this model is not that it's the right model. I don't think that we're anywhere near the right model yet. The point is that it is completely self-contained. It is an entire history of the universe which does not rely on anything outside. It just is like that. I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in. The demand for more than a complete and consistent model that fits the data is a relic of a pre-scientific view of the world. And when you do this integral, you get something which makes no sense whatsoever. An infinity. Total nonsense. In fact, you get an infinite sequence of infinities. It means the collapse of physics as we know it. You know, something is fundamentally wrong. I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in. The laws of physics are balanced on a razor's edge for life to occur. For example, if you didn't have something like gravity that pulled matter together, you would never get planets, you wouldn't get stars, you wouldn't get any complex organisms. If you didn't have the strong nuclear force, there would be nothing to hold protons and neutrons together in the nucleus. And so you wouldn't have any atoms, so no chemistry. If you didn't have the electromagnetic force, you would have no bonding between chemicals. You'd have no light, and the list goes on. So you need all these sorts of fundamental principles have to be in place in order for life to occur. Wipe out one of those principles, wipe out one of those laws, no life. Strobel learned that life also hinges on the precise strengths and relative values of many different physical constants. One example of this fine-tuning is the force of gravity. Imagine a ruler divided up into one-inch increments and then stretched across the entire universe, a distance of some 14 billion light years. For the purposes of illustration, the ruler represents the possible range for gravity. In other words, the setting for the strength of gravity could have been anywhere along the ruler, but it just happens to be situated in exactly the right place so that life is possible. Now, if you were to change the force of gravity by moving the setting just one inch compared to the entire width of the universe, the effect on life would be catastrophic. The basis for thinking our universe may have been created with purpose. John Polkinghorne worked alongside an astronomer who made a critical discovery that shook his beliefs. One of the great triumphs of astrophysics in the second half of the 20th century was to figure out how the elements are made. Because the very early universe is very simple, it only makes very simple elements. In fact, hydrogen and helium, the two simplest elements, and you can't really do very much for them. They have very boring chemistry. You need much more elements if you're going to have something as interesting as life. And in particular, you need carbon. The chemistry of life is the chemistry of carbon. So where does carbon come from? 
There's only one place in the whole universe where carbon is made. It's made in the interior nuclear furnaces of the stars. Every atom of carbon in our bodies was once inside a star. We're people of stardust. Now, how that happened was figured out in Cambridge. Fred Hoyle, a senior colleague of mine, uh, was one of the leading figures in this. And they were trying to figure out how carbon was made. They had helium, and if they could make three heliums stick together, that would make carbon. But it's, they couldn't figure out how to do that. You, to get three small things like that to stick together at once, you can't do it. Okay, so we do it bit by bit, make two stick together, that makes beryllium, stays around a bit, another one comes along, makes carbon. But it doesn't work, because beryllium is very, very unstable. It just disappears psh, like that. So they were stuck. And then Fred had a good idea, and he said, um, it'll just go if there is something called a resonance, a very enhanced effect, uh, which is just at the right energy in carbon to make that extra one stick on much, much more quickly than you would have thought. So you're very pleased with yourself. We went off the nuclear data tables just to check that this resonance, this effect, was there, and it wasn't. And uh, so he was, Fred was a very stubborn persistent friend. He rang up some friends and said, and said, look, you've missed something in carbon. There's a resonance there that you haven't spotted, but I know exactly where it is, so you had to have this energy. And they were probably a bit reluctant to look, but in the end they went and looked and they found it. And that's a wonderful scientific story. But also it struck Fred that it's more than a scientific story, because of course if the laws of nuclear physics had been a tiny bit different, either there would be no resonance at all, or it would be some other energy which would be no good. And Fred, who had a life long commitment to atheism is reported to have said in the Yorkshire accident beyond my past you know, take, the universe is a put up job in other words this can't be just a happy accident this is too significant for that there must be something behind all this because Fred didn't like the word God he says some capital I intelligence has monkeyed with the laws of the universe observing the universe then can spring riddles for atheism too Hoyle's groundbreaking discovery led to what subsequently became known as the Anthropic Principle. Uh, Fred, due to Fred Hoyle, who was an atheist astrophysicist. Interesting background to Fred Hoyle because originally he uh, was opposed to the Big Bang because he thought it meant that the universe had an origin and if it had an origin in time, you might need a god to make it. As an atheist, was tr really troubled by that. And he proposed a, the steady state theory the, uh, instead, which was eventually overthrown. But, and the Big Bang reigns supreme. But Hoyle did some really, really important work on how the chemical elements uh, of which uh, the stars, of the planets, and uh, ultimately us, uh, of what, what they are made. Um, and he discovered that you need a very, very fine balance of the forces in nature in order to make carbon inside stars, which is essential for life, and in order to make oxygen uh, without destroying all the carbon in the process. So two uh, seeming coincidences necessary uh, in order to, to get the materials for life. And when Hoyle made that discovery, he was moved to remark that a super intellect has monkeyed with physics and with all of chemistry and biology and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. It's a put up job, it was the kind of way he expressed it. He was deeply impressed by this. And, and here you have uh, an, an atheist, a man who called religion an illusion. And he uh, said that in books and uh, on TV programs. And the Point, certainly we all asked, well, which is the best argument you've yet come up against from the other side? And I think every one of us picks the fine-tuning one. That's the, the, the most intriguing. The golden blocks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Fine, the fine-tuning, the one degree, well, one degree, one hair different to nothing. But even though it doesn't prove design, doesn't prove a designer, could all have happened without... It, it, you have to spend time thinking about it working on it. It's not a trivial... We all say that. You have to spend time thinking about it and working on it. It's not a trivial... We all say that. A lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe, there is no talk about what role God might have played in bringing the universe about. You have to spend time thinking about it and working on it. 
It's not a trivial. We all say that. 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 A lot of talk about the origin and nature of the universe. There is no talk, no talk, no talk, no talk about what role God might have played. You have to spend time thinking about it. Working on it. It's not a trivial. We all say that. No talk, no talk, no talk, no talk. Well, theists say God did it. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants to have exactly the right values. There is no talk about what role God might have played. Uh, God tuned, God twiddled the knobs and tuned the physical constants. It is not an idea that is taken seriously. A cosmological constant is tuned to one part and 10 to the 120, 120 decimal places. Nobody thinks that's accidental. That is not a reasonable idea. That is not a reasonable idea. That is not a reasonable idea. Um, having accepted the, the word of physicists that there is a, an element of fine-tuning, an element of fine-tuning, an element of fine-tuning. I tried to lay out three possible explanations. One, one would be God, which as I've said isn't an explanation at all. One would be um, the um, multiverse, and then anthropically with hindsight saying we have to be sitting in one of the universes that could give us. But the third one, which I've attributed to you, oh, no. possibly wrongly, oh, no. uh, would be um, I, what I call the macho physicists, who say, well, uh, it's just that we don't understand um, um, why these things are the, are the way they are. One day we will, uh, it, when, when we have a theory of everything. It, it, it will be understood, but it sounds from our conversation as though that I, I misrepresented you then. It sounds from our conversation as though that I, I misrepresented you then. That I, I misrepresented you then. That I, I misrepresented you then. Distort uh, the... The, uh, the very disciplines that they claim is the basis for their ideology. I, I misrepresented you then. I, I misrepresented you then. I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in. I don't think one should underestimate uh, the fix we're in. That in the end, we will not be able to explain uh, the world. That uh, we will have some laws, of, some set of laws of nature. We will not be able to derive them on the ground simply of mathematical consistency, because we can already think of mathematically consistent laws that don't describe the world as we know it. Unbreakable rules, laws of nature. That in the end, we will not be able to explain uh, the world, that uh, we will have some laws, of, some set of laws of nature, we will not be able to derive them on the ground simply of mathematical consistency, and we will always be left with a um, question, why are the laws of nature what they are rather than some other laws? And uh, I, I don't see any way out of that. I, I don't see any way out of that. I, I don't see any way out of that. The fact that the constants of nature are suitable for life, which is clearly true, we observe. Um, the final idea, which I think probably most physicists um, at least have some time for, is the multiverse theory. No one has constructed a theory in which that's true. I mean, it's not only a speculation, the theory would be speculative, but we don't have a theory in which that speculation is mathematically realized. So,
And the fact that the cancellation is so precise means that the number of the universes in the multiverse you need to postulate in order to anthropically be comfortable with, which is very, very large. And it must be at least 10 to the 56, or yeah, in fact, exactly. uh, yeah. if you think you have some idea about fluctuations at even shorter distances, I think you would say at least 10 to the 120, at least 10 to the 120, at least 10 to the 120. It's a little disturbing, disturbing, disturbing. No one has constructed a theory in which that's true. I mean, it's not only a speculation, the theory would be speculative, but we don't even have a theory in which that speculation is mathematically realized. So, Once again, physicists find that a, a bit of a stretch. They find it not exactly implausible, but they think of it as a bit of a cop-out. I actually think it's rather an elegant explanation, um, and uh, it's, I, I, I think it's probably true, but I don't know enough physics to, to know. Distort uh, the, the, uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. These are not the right vocabulary words. These are not the right vocabulary words. These are not the right vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. Vocabulary words. is distort of uh, the the uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology uh, but what they have done uh, i think like uh, many utopians is distort of uh, the the uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology uh, but what they have done uh, i think like uh, many utopians is distort uh, the the uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Uh, but what they have done, uh, I think, like uh, many utopians, is distort uh, the the uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology. Distort uh, the the. Uh, the very disciplines that they claim as the basis for their ideology.